So Fn converges to F in measure for if for every epsilon we have that mu of Fn minus F bigger than epsilon converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So now you measure the set where Fn of x minus F of x is bigger than epsilon. And you show that this set goes to zero in measure. Okay, that's what it needs to be true for every epsilon. Uh, of course, uh, we are in a measure space for all of these different notions, right? Because when you say it converges almost everywhere, you mean that with respect to mu, the set where it doesn't converge has measure zero. But it's always with respect to a given mu. When you say it's integrable, it's the integral with respect to mu, which is finite. Okay, so that's the same mu we are using here when, when we, we say that. So what's the relation between the two previous uh, convergence? Well, the first relation is easy. And it simply says that if Fn converges to F in L1, then Fn converges to F in measure. So L1 is a stronger convergence criterion than uh, uh, convergence in measure. So the proof of that, we look at our integral of Fn minus F. This is the thing that goes to 0 when Fn converges to F in L1. And by now, you're probably not surprised if we say that this is bigger than this. Okay, that's always the same type of argument that you use. You split your domain in two, and you keep the one that's interesting. This one is the interesting one, because that's the thing I want to show goes to 0. OK, so this is bigger than epsilon, fn minus f bigger than epsilon, d mu. And therefore, this is epsilon mu of fn minus f, bigger than epsilon. Right? So now we can look at this thing and say that mu of fn minus f bigger than epsilon is squeezed between 0 and 1 over epsilon fn minus f d mu. But remember that your epsilon is fixed in this thing. Okay, you pick an epsilon, of course, uh, your epsilon can be arbitrarily small, but once you picked it, that's it, it's fixed, and n goes to infinity. So, of course, this goes to 0. And this goes to 0 because our hypothesis is that this integral goes to 0. You're dividing by epsilon, which is a very small number, but it's a fixed number. So the whole thing goes to 0. And you're done. OK, because you want, you, that's what you wanted to show, that this measure, the measure of this set goes to 0. So we conclude that Fn converges to F in measure. Now, what about the relation with almost everywhere convergence? There we get the following. If Fn converges to F in measure, then there exists an Nj subsequent such that f and j converges to f almost everywhere. So 
So you can't find a subsequence of Fn that converges to F almost everywhere. But not the whole sequence. So how do we prove that? Well, uh, yeah, we know that mu of Fn minus F bigger than 1 over 2 to the j goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So uh, if I, this is a sequence of real numbers and it goes to zero, I know exactly what this means. It means that whatever a I pick, there exists an n so that if n is bigger than capital N, then mu of fn minus f bigger than 1 over 2 to the j is less than a. Okay, normally I would put mu of this thing minus zero in absolute value, but all of that reduces to this. It's a j here. Right? That's what it means to converge to zero. Now I'm going to pick uh, an a to be 2 to the j can pick any A I want. So I'm going to pick this one, which is the same one I have here. But that's OK. OK? And I'm going to, to, to denote my capital N. So NJ is this capital N. Okay, I know I can find a capital N for which this thing is true. Well, I'm going to call it Nj because it depends on J, obviously. So what we have at this point is the following. So this gives us a subsequence F and J with a property that mu of F and J minus F bigger than 1 over 2 to the J is less than 1 over 2 to the J. Okay, that's what we have constructed so far. I don't know about you, but when I see this one or two to the J's, I have the urging of summing things, okay? Because you are going to get something finite. So let's do that, and that's the whole purpose. So we can sum these guys. And this series is going to be finite. Now that should remind you of something. We have seen if I have a sum of mu of a j finite, what does this imply? Does it remind you anything? It does? So mu of lim sub is going to be 0. We did prove that, didn't we? OK, if, we, we, if you don't remember, we try to prove it. It's very easy. Oh, 
but I need I need to have a finite uh, space to do that, don't I? Let's see what our friend here says. Sub, because then I'll have an intersection. Huh. Okay, um, let me think. So what do I have here? Uh, so I need the first one. This union. Yeah, okay. No, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. Okay, so we'll come back to this if, if you want me to. So this is a true statement. And then uh, what we get is, therefore, we need to, to know what the limb sub of the AJs is. So we want AJ uh, for J, well, uh, bigger than K. And we're going to do intersection over all K of this guy. This is what limb sub is by definition of AJ. So, uh, what we are saying is that this guy is a null set. Okay, this is a null set. So, almost every x is not in there. Almost every x is in the complement of this guy. Okay, so for almost every x, which means that uh, the other ones are in an null set, we have that x belongs to the complement of this guy. which means that x belongs to the union of the intersection of uh, the complement of each one of these aj, which means that for every x, there exists a k such that for every j bigger than k, x belongs to a j complement. And what is a j complement? Is this guy here. So it's, it means that fn of j of x minus f of x is less than 1 over 2 to the j. Okay, because it's the complement of a j. So I'm smaller than 1 over 2 to the j. Which means that fn j of x converges to f of x as j goes to infinity. For almost every x. So we are done. fn j 
converges to f almost everywhere. So let's prove the lemma now, mm -hmm. since we don't seem to remember it. So how do we do this? Well, uh, let's look at limpsup because uh, so limpsup of a j is intersection over k of, uh, let's call these guys FKs or BKs, where BK is the union J bigger than K of AJ. BK is a decreasing sequence. And we can pass the limit inside uh, if we have a, the additional hypothesis that mu of b1 is finite, right? So what's mu of b1? So mu of b1 is mu of the union of OA uh, a, a j for j bigger than 1. And this is less than the series mu of a j. And that we assume is finite. So mu of b1 is finite. And therefore, the limit of mu of bn exists. and is equal to mu of intersection of the BNs, which is exactly our limbs up. But each, um, OK, I'm not quite done. Um, so what do we have? Uh, on the other hand, mu of BN is less than sum from J bigger than N of mu of uh, BJ. Uh, AJ. Sorry. Okay, I'm just doing my definition and the fact that mu of a union is less than the sum of uh, the, the measures. Now, this is the tail of a convergent series. Remember? So this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, if your whole series converges, the tail must go to zero. Okay, you take less and less terms. So mu bn converges to 0, and therefore mu of the intersection is 0. So that gives us our mu of limb sub equal to 0. Yeah, one, uh, one thing which is important is the following uh, property. If Fn goes to F in measure, and Fn goes to G in measure, then F is equal to G almost everywhere. which is reassuring, right? You have only one limit almost everywhere. OK. 
how do you prove that? Well, you can write that f minus g bigger than epsilon is included in, OK, so maybe we need a, so that's the thing we want. Okay. So what we, what we do is we say that f minus g is f minus fn plus fn minus g, which by the triangular inequality is f minus fn plus fn minus g. Now, uh, the other thing that uh, you need to observe is that if f minus g is bigger than epsilon, then either f minus fn is bigger than epsilon over 2, or fn minus g is bigger than epsilon over 2. Why? Well, if they are both smaller than epsilon over 2, the sum is less than epsilon, and you cannot get that f minus g is bigger than epsilon. You see it? Okay, if both of these is, are less than epsilon over 2, then the sum is less than epsilon, but you want this guy to be strictly bigger than epsilon. So that's not possible. Therefore, this is included in f minus fn bigger than epsilon over 2 union fn minus g bigger than epsilon over 2. And now we take the measure. So mu of f minus g bigger than epsilon is less than mu of f minus fn bigger than epsilon over 2 plus mu of fn minus g bigger than epsilon over 2. So again, you, you invoke the squeezing principle because you have 0 on this side. And this goes to 0. This goes to 0. Therefore, mu of f minus g bigger than epsilon is 0 for every epsilon. Now, does this prove that f is equal to g almost everywhere? Okay, at this point, what I know is that for every epsilon, f minus g bigger than epsilon is 0. How can I go from there to f is equal to g almost everywhere? Right, let's take epsilon equal 1 over n. And let a n be the set f minus g bigger than 1 over n. White up our first sequence is a n. It's increasing, right? Okay, bigger than something smaller and smaller, so it's an increasing sequence. And what's the union of the an? This is what the union looks like.
is zero. It converges to mu of the union of the A ends, which is also zero. And this is mu of f minus g in absolute value strictly bigger than zero. And that tells me that the set where f is different from g, which is exactly this set, is, has measure zero. Therefore, f is equal to g almost everywhere. So limits are unique. This is true for any metric space. But at this late hour, I can't remember whether uh, this uh, distance can be made into a metric space. It seems to me that no. But I would need to check on that. Okay? Because some spaces, some, some topological spaces can be put a metric on. Some cannot. Okay. Anyway, so in this case, uh, at least this property holds. Yeah, the, the limit is unique. Now, uh, what else can we say about these things? Yeah, we have this. Uh, Okay, so an easy consequence uh, is that I knew this was going to happen. If Fn converges to F in L1, then there exists an nj such that fnj converges to f almost everywhere. Uh, we like almost everywhere because it's, uh, it's the most natural one. You just look at, you take your x, you do fn of x, you look what, at what happens. Uh, the measure thing is a little trickier. Okay? You need to measure the space where the difference is bigger than epsilon and show that for every epsilon this thing goes to zero. It's not so trivial. Okay? That's why whenever we can, we rely on the subsequence that converges almost everywhere. And it's very useful. So uh, how do you prove that? So. Uh, if Fn converges to F in L1, we have proved that this implies that Fn converges to F in measure, in measure. And this, in turn, implies that there is Nj, so that Fnj converges to F almost everywhere. Okay, so pretty easy. Now, a consequence is that if Fn converges to F almost everywhere and Fn converges to G in L1, then uh, F and G must be equal almost everywhere. Okay, because when we looked at our counterexample, uh, we had that uh, Fn was converging to zero in almost, almost everywhere, but Fn was not converging to zero in L1. But maybe Fn was converging to something else. Well, no, that's not possible. So if it's not converging in L1 to the same limit, it means it doesn't converge. That's what this is telling us. So proof of that. Uh, 
so Fn converges to G to G in L1 means that we exist an Nj so that Fnj converges to G almost everywhere. But Fnj converges to F almost everywhere. Right? It converges to F almost everywhere because Fn converges to F almost everywhere. So if I take a subsequence of something converging, it must converge to the same limit. So we have now two almost everywhere limits which are equal almost everywhere. Okay? So this implies that F is equal to G almost everywhere. That's because the limit in the reals is unique. So we okay. Uh, this is useful. These these different notions are uh, useful to prove a so-called Lusin's theorem. And I have already quoted uh, Egorov's theorem, but I was really thinking about Lusin's theorem, not, uh, not Egorov. So it says the following. Uh, take f from a, b into r, and assume that f is Lebesgue measurable. Then for every epsilon, there exists a compact set E and included in AB so that uh, F is continuous on E and mu of, well, M of the complement of E is less than epsilon. So what this theorem tells me is, give me any measurable function, Lebesgue measurable function. Then I can find you and give me any epsilon. I can find your set on which your function is continuous. And uh, the complement of a set has only measured less than epsilon. Okay? But that's not the same. That's not as strong as saying that your function is continuous almost everywhere. You don't get that. What you get is that your function is continuous on an arbitrary large, in this sense, set. That's what you get. But you cannot quite get to almost everywhere, of course, because there are functions that are not continuous almost everywhere. So that's a very nice theorem because it, it gives you a relation between continuity and measurability. Okay, it tells you that really when you think measurable function, you can think, well, it's almost continuous in this sense. That's, uh, that's why it's nice. It also gives us a link between uh, Lebesgue measurable and Riemann integrable because Riemann integrable is continuous almost everywhere. And Lebesgue measurable is uh, continuous in, in, in an arbitrary uh, large set. Okay. 
Okay. The theorem gets a little uh, technical, so I'm not going to prove that. Uh, Rudin is a good source to find the proof of this, if you're interested. The complex and unreal analysis. So, let's see. Yes, yeah, so we need to provide a counterexample for so what we have shown at this point is that uh, if we have convergence in L1, it implies convergence in measure. And convergence in measure implies uh, convergence almost everywhere along the subsequence. So that's why I'm putting dots here because it's not really, it doesn't imply, but you, you do have a subsequence that converges almost everywhere. And these two do not have any, I mean, well, what you have is because of this, you also have uh, an almost everywhere for a subsequence. Now, uh, if you have convergence in measure, it doesn't necessarily uh, imply convergence in L1. Okay, the, the converse here is not true. And to see that, we can take the same uh, example as before. So if we do 1 over n, 1, 0. So we take our Lebesgue measure and we look at the set M where Fn Um, Fn minus 0 is bigger than epsilon. Okay, we are interested in the set where Fn of x is bigger than epsilon. And, uh, okay. What, uh, what happens is that if we take our, if, so remember that epsilon is fixed and then goes to infinity. So as, uh, uh, what are the values of this function? The, this function is, is either zero or one over n. And if our n is large enough, 1 over n is going to be less than epsilon. So this thing is going to be empty. There are no x such that fn of x is bigger than epsilon. Okay? So we are measuring the empty set provided our n is bigger than 1 over epsilon. So that's a 0. And of course, it converges to 0. So this tells me that Fn converges to zero in measure. But we know that Fn does not converge to zero in L1. So this provides a counterexample.
Okay, so homework for this section. Page 63, so 33, 34, 35, 38A. And this will be due on November 28. So you have quite a bit of time to think about it. Questions? Okay, so Next week we go on we, we go over the review and no homework is due and <coughs> uh, we'll continue with uh, this chapter two and we'll talk about product spaces. Okay? So let's stop here for today.